surgery and this lecture is on Bowden and Heart Disease. It's a little bit dry, I have to say. It's not as interesting as the other one, but I'm trying to go through the slides with it. So, uh, right. so I did cardiology in my first presentation. I really enjoyed it. We definitely recommend it to anybody. Um, learn a lot and I was in my as well. So, right. so this is just a quick outline of what we're going to go through today. It's a very big subject, so I'm just going to try and cover the main things that you may come across in finance. And it will be just a bit of a simple path to go on this. I'm sure you'll be glad to know that. Right, so valvular disease. So we've got four main valves in the heart. And um, these are the main things you really need to know. And if you know these associations, you'll be fine in written exams. So aortic and mitral valves, they are the main valves that are involved in valvular heart disease. If you've got tricuspid valve involvement, that's usually secondary effects such as right heart failure. So if you've got somebody with symptoms of right heart failure, then in any kind of EMPs or NTQs, you can think about tricuspid valve disease. And then pulmonary valves, they may need to do with congenital heart disease. So if you've got somebody with like the trilogy of colon, etc., then it's more likely to be pulmonary um, valves that are involved. So I'm sure you all know in terms of anatomy, you just need to know basic anatomy where the valves are. Okay. So why do you think valves go wrong?
So what you get is that the aortic valve becomes very thickened and this causes obstruction of the outflow. So you've got lots of blood in the left ventricle that's unable to be pumped out because you've got this obstruction. And you get this turbulent flow during systole, and this is why aortic stenosis, the murmur in it, is a systolic murmur rather than a diastolic murmur. Okay? So if you understand this pathophysiology, you're able to sort of work out what kind of murmur you should get. Right? So aortic stenosis is a systolic murmur because that's when the left ventricle is trying to pump all the blood out and it's causing a turbulent flow. Right, and as a result of that, you've got all this blood in the left ventricle, and that's causing uh, the left ventricle to become bigger and to hypertrophy, right? <coughs> Some of the causes uh, we've already mentioned congenital, such as um, if the aortic valve has two cusps rather than three, rheumatic fever, this would usually present with aortic leakage <coughs> if they've got aortic stenosis and passes to rheumatic fever then. Um, they probably like to have aortic leakage as well. And one of the most common ones is degeneration. So that's when the valve just becomes calcified. Okay. So, um, so these are the signs and symptoms we're going to go through. Right, so the way I remember them, um, it's aortic stenosis. So everything is with S. So you get this triad of SAD, which I'm sure you all know about. Syncope angina dyspnea. Just remember that for aortic stenosis, SAD. Syncope angina dyspnea, easier. And then for the signs, again, everything starts with S. So you get this systolic mama, it's an ejection systolic mama that radiates to the carotids. And it's usually described as a diamond chain, as you can see. And the pose that you get is a slow rising pose, right? So let's just have a quick listen if this works. I mean, the left ventricle will hypertrophy, but there's no changes in terms of volume overload. And you also get the left ventricular heat. So aortic stenosis, all the signs are with S, and all the symptoms are with S. So that's the way I used to remember things. Okay, so investigations. So you do an ECG, and that's what you're going to see. What is it? Okay. And how do you know it's left ventricular hypertrophy? Have you got any kind of um, rule to say it's left ventricular hypertrophy? How high should it be? Yeah, I'd be one of these that do more than five. Yeah, that's one way. There's, there's lots of different ways that you can actually diagnose LVH on an ECG. The one I've used here is if the S weighing B2 and the R weighing B5 are more than 35 centimeters. But there's, different, there's different classification systems. As long as you learn one, and when you have an ECG and it shows LVH, then you can actually sort of say why it is LVH. Okay? So on this ECG you get LVH, and then you go to a chest X-ray, and you see um, a big heart as well as a cardiomegaly. Um, the diagnostic investigation is obviously an echo, either a TTE or a TOE. Then most often they do a transthoracic echo rather than a transesophageal echo, which is mostly done for things like infective endocarditis. So that would be your diagnostic um, diagnostic test. And at the same time, they often do um, cardiac catheterization. And this is just to see if patients may need um, coronary artery bypass at the same time when they're doing, say, a valve replacement. So very often in, on the cardiology ward, you would have to request an angiogram as well at the same time. So in terms of management, how would you divide the management? <laughs> surgical management for, for everything, that's your, that's your first point when you're asked the question about management. So medical therapy, you just think about risk factors modification, and then surgical therapy, aortic valve replacements, um, balloon aortic valve plastic, or um, there's this new procedure called ATAVI, um, which is actually only done in specialised centres in the UK that have this hard MDT team that can look after patients. And there's usually a named consultant that will perform these procedures. So all patients that are listed for TAVI, they would go under 
uh, the specialized consultant. And it's essentially a way to do an aortic valve replacement without the risks of surgery. So often in patients that are older and they will not withstand the general anesthetic, etc., they may they may be suitable to have a TAVI. Okay. So that's something that's coming out and you may you may need to know about it. Fine, so um, just moving on to aortic regurg. Basically, um, so what happens is the valve is leaky and this causes a little flow. Um, so you get this turbulent flow from the aorta back into the left ventricle. And because of the backflow, which occurs in diastole, the left ventricle over becomes overloaded and dilates as a result of that. And because this is happening in diastole, that's why the murmur you get is a diastolic murmur rather than a systolic murmur. Okay? So some of the causes, how do you categorize the causes in AR? Slightly different to AS.
So some of the causes, the main one is rheumatic fever. In any exam question, if they've got rheumatic fever, then it's likely to be microstenosis, and then you get all these other rare ones. So I'm uh, just going through the symptoms and signs. <coughs> so we already went through on um, why you get this buildup of pressure in the left atrium, which leads to the left atrium failing, and the pressure in the pulmonary artery is building up, and therefore causing further problems and heart failure, congestion, etc. So the way to remember the signs is, well, that's the way I remember them. They all, they all start with M for mitrostenosis, so the murmur is a mid-diastolic murmur, and they also get this male flush on the cheeks. And something you check for, as we said, is um, AF. So let's just have a listen. It's a very, very quiet murmur, and you actually need to listen with the bell. So when you're doing your cardiovascular examination, make sure that you know you switch it over and you listen to the bell and you get the patient to turn on their left side so that you're showing the examiner you're listening for a mitrostenosis murmur. It's very quiet.
have signs of inflative encephalitis, but they haven't got a positive culture or anything on their record. So we just sort of label them as, as culture negative inflective encephalitis. So the risk factors, I'm sure you know, prosthetic heart valves, that's probably the most, the most common risk factor for somebody to have inflective encephalitis. Uh, and obviously these are all things you need to ask in your history, um, such as dental procedures or drugs use, etc. Okay, so here are the symptoms and the signs. So general signs of sepsis, if somebody comes with a pyrex of a known origin, infected endocrine is really one of your top differentials as well. So general signs of sepsis, cardiac manifestations, um, heart failure, that is really sort of quite a bad sign for um, infective endocarditis. And then all of these um, signs that you know, you're saying about, oh, I'm looking for osmonaut, I'm looking for Jane Whaley's, etc. This is what they actually are. So the osmonauts are tender nodules, whereas the Jane Whaley lesions are non-tender. Okay, so that's an important differential between the two. You, you're unlikely to see them, but it's just something that you need to know if you want to talk about them. Um, and then lot spots as well. They're basically hemorrhages in the retina, and they have pale centers in the middle. Um, and then these are some of the complications of infective endocarditis, so meningitis, renal failure, and hemolytic anemia as well. Right, so what do you think that is? What sign is that? Yeah, so are they tender or non tender? Non tender. Non tender, So that's Jane Way lesions, and that one? So that's one of those knots. So that's one of the hands there. So that's splinter hemorrhages. They are actually quite common in infective endocarditis. We've had a lot of patients with endocarditis that did have splinter hemorrhages. But obviously the most common cause for them is what? Trauma. What did you say? Trauma or congenital as well, possibly trauma. So that's splinter hemorrhages. So that's what's got. So, so can you see this here? It's quite a, like it's like a plain hemorrhage, but it's got this pale center in the middle, which differentiates it from a plain hemorrhage. So that's a rough spot. <coughs> and everybody knows what that is. Plumbing. And you know the four different stages of plumbing. Yeah. I can't remember the number. I did, I did not know the last
it's a very good team and um, they really look after our patients. So, because there have to be such a long treatment as well, it can be obviously quite psychologically uh, affecting them. So, it's really important that um, we manage them appropriately and things get rolling um, soon. So, the description of murmurs um, one thing to remember that can be very, very useful in any situation, written exams or OSCEs, is right sided murmurs are heard best on inspiration. Okay, have you all heard of that? It will come really handy. So the way I remember it is right for inspiration because it starts with an end. So obviously left-sided murmurs will be best heard on expiration. <coughs> so we'll go through some examples later where that can actually help you. And just um, furthermore, a description of the murmurs. This is how we would, we would read this quite a bit in detail. But the main thing is, is whether you can tell if it's a diastolic or a systolic murmur. Where is it? Where does it radiate? What does it sound like? And that's your, that's your grading, so you don't need to know much in detail. Most murmurs that you hear will probably be grade three. Okay? So if you're in the OSCE and you really haven't got a clue what it is, you know there's a murmur there, but you just haven't got a clue. So it's likely to be AS or MR, it's likely to be a systolic murmur, and you can say where it's heard best, but you, you can obviously hear that, that's easy to see. And it's likely to be a grade three out of six, and just for radiation, <coughs> you know, depending on where it radiates, but it's likely not to, to radiate anywhere, depending on the case. So you already can, so even if you go completely blank, then there's already a few things that you can be thinking about before you present your findings to the examiner. And then at the end, don't wait for the examiner to ask you questions, just just say what your differentials are and what you'd like to do next, which is most likely an echo, ECG, etc., all the things we've gone through. Okay, so just very, um, just a few cases. So this is an EMQ type of question, we're going to get choice of answers, but just be thinking what to be going on before we see the answers. Any ideas in